Welcome to this week's episode of Cook and Weekly. Joining us this week is our old friend, Christian Kinofner, has been with us a few times from Tovera and is going to be a speaker at Cook this year. But more than anything, I'm happy to see you again, Christian. How are you? <laughs> Great to see you again, too, Luca. I'm doing well. Great. So I hear you have a new project going on that sounds quite interesting in these days of uh, AI assistance and voice activated anything. So it's really, I'm really curious to hear what it is. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's always it's always good to get back to my old you know my old friend voice. Just you know wherever wherever my career and just interest <laughs> seem to take me, I uh, I land I land back in you know just like people talking somehow. Whether it's VoIP twenty years ago or whether it's a uh, you know open source uh, voice assistant today, it's just it's voice voice voice. <laughs> good. So. Uh... Well, first of all, uh, would you maybe like to start with a quick introduction about yourself? So we, we set the stage. Sure. So speaking of 20 years, um, my, uh, my sort of like, you know, introduction to the whole community and, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's, uh, you know, voice and real time communications, whatever else, I uh, started back in 2004. I, I created the Ast Linux project when I first discovered Asterisk and, um, you know, that, uh, you know, got me. Um, you know, of course, I met I met you know Tony and Brian and Mike and everybody. Uh, you know, going back all the way to the beginning of uh, you know of that project, and and needless to say, um, you know, was very happy to get into FreeSwitch and uh, ended up starting a uh, a business communications company, essentially start to start communications that was uh, largely based off of Ast Linux, and so. We uh, we we sold that a few years ago, and I've been I've been just kind of having fun playing around and doing things that interest me, things like Willow. Oh, cool! So it's called Willow. Willow, yes. And what is it? <laughs> uh, so Willow is a completely open source, locally hosted voice assistant interface. So essentially, think of um, you know like an Amazon Echo, Alexa our Google Home, um, you know, kind of Siri, those, you know, those types of, of devices and ecosystems, um, minus the kind of creepy, you have a microphone in your house that's potentially, you know, mm -hmm. streaming things to, to Amazon. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, not to beat up on them too much right out the gates, but, um, you know, it, they're, they're not selling these devices at a loss because they're your friend and they really want to help you with these mm -hmm. tasks. They're selling these devices at a loss because they're they're trying to you know pull you more and more into their into their ecosystem. So um, it's a kind of a classic case where um, the you know kind of the provider or the manufacturer of the solution isn't exactly well aligned with the user's interests and goals, and uh, we you know we wanted to to do something about that with Willow. Good, yeah. So uh, open source, that's interesting. What does uh, open source mean in this scenario? Like uh, given that the software can be open source, but is the hardware also open source? So the, uh, the hardware that we currently target is, um, is from Espressive Systems, which is kind of the famous maker of the yeah. ESP8266, the ESP32. So they, um, they very interestingly, they made a new, uh, essentially like a new platform. It's the ESP32S3 that has a bunch of kind of neural acceleration uh, features uh, in addition to just kind of being generally more powerful. Uh, so the device we target, of course, I, I, you know, I have some here. Um, they have this kind of, I like to call it ready for the kitchen counter um, device that they've manufactured that's based off of the ESP32 S3. And um, it, it, my kind of, my, my, not really a pitch, I'm not much of a pitch man, but um, it's, you know, you can buy them anywhere, uh, you know, Espresso has worldwide distribution yeah. and they just kind of handle it. And for $50, you take it out of the box, you flash it with Willow and you put it on your kitchen counter and it doesn't look like a science project that you threw together with wires and random speakers and microphones. Yeah. It's open source for all practical purposes at the price point, given that. Even if you both the components separately, is not gonna. It cannot cost more less than that. So it is. yes, exactly. So um, by the time you know you factor in, it has dual microphone array for high quality speech with acoustic echo cancellation and gain control and source separation, all of those different things. 
um, built-in speaker, LEDs, some buttons, uh, capacitive touchscreen LCD display, and the enclosure for $50. You, you, know, you couldn't buy the components and try to put it together yourself with the 3D printed enclosure for that. So, um, you know, tremendously uh, thankful to Espresso that they've, you know, that they've made this platform available. And I think it's also important to point out for, for people that are really, you know, into the maker stuff, which a lot of us tend to be, um, the hardware is open as well. So full schematics, bill of materials, uh, you know, ability to uh, print the enclosure, kind of just do whatever you want. Um, there's, you know, actually other products like those from N5 Stack, the Core S3, that are largely based off of the hardware open source uh, design from Espresso. Wow, that's super interesting. It's a, I didn't even know there were ready-made solutions on the market that you could use to build things like that. Yeah, it, it, um, it was, you know, probably one of the most interesting things. If I, I could just kind of go into the background of the of Willow and the Genesis here. So, yep. um, I've I've always sort of been somewhat involved or or adjacent to kind of healthcare technology or or digital health. Um, I was I was involved in another early stage startup that um, essentially made a, a, a smartphone application with bespoke Android and, and uh, iOS devices for healthcare providers in patient care settings. So hospitals, doctors, offices, whatever. Um, and out of that work, uh, back in 2020, a year that we all remember, and uh, you know, the coronavirus uh, going around, um, healthcare especially had a renewed focus on we don't want to touch anything. If, if we if we have to touch anything, that's just another thing that we have to clean. Um, that's another you know potential uh, kind of infection path for this you know this novel new virus. So I was approached by uh, essentially a, a Fortune 500 healthcare digital tech company uh, to say, "Hey, we you know we're really interested in these voice devices." I mean, even then you know. A, Echo Alexa was five, six years old, at least something like that. Um, but we can't possibly put an Echo device in somebody's, you know, in a doctor's office or, or, or a hospital room for a variety of reasons, right? Um, so uh, in working through that project, essentially determined it's a little early for this, um, just kind mm -hmm. of the state of AI and speech recognition and text to speech, all these other different kind of foundational technologies just sort of really aren't there yet. And then the next problem was, well, what are we going to do about the hardware? And even though they're, you know, they they manufacture all kinds of stuff. I mean, you basically, you you look around, a, you know, a doctor's office or a hospital room or something, and their name is stamped on a lot of the hardware that's there. And even with that, it was challenging, again, kind of with the current state of things at the time. Well, even at sort of the price points in healthcare, which are astronomical, how are we really going to even figure out the hardware side of this? So unfortunately, that project kind of stalled out because of some of these fundamental issues. And, you know, but it always sort of bothered me. I thought, well, this should be possible, you know? And then you started to see things like OpenAI, you know, actually staying true to their name, Open, and, uh, and releasing Whisper for speech recognition, which yeah. we all know and love and use all over the place. Um, that was kind of a key moment in and of itself. And then I stumbled across the, this ESP box from Espresso, and I thought, okay, we finally have kind of both sides of this sort of fundamental equation that we need to sort of, you know, go back to this project that, you know, that was kind of the one that got away back in, back in 2020. And, um, you know, we've got the, we've got the hardware, we've got the AI side, we should be able to actually make this happen. And that was roughly three months ago. And, um, you know, here we are with Willow today. That's very, very interesting. So uh, a few questions because I'm, I mean, I come from a different angle, but I've been playing with similar solutions. We're building a locally deployable uh, AI assistant for the edge for 5G nodes. So it shares a lot of uh, 
shares a lot of interesting uh, interesting parts with yours. So uh, entirely open source means that you're using an open source speech recognition tool, too, which is Whisper, uh, I guess. Sorry, so fully open source meaning what? I didn't quite catch it there. Sorry. So uh, open source means that all the stack is open source, right? So what uh, what are the components that you're using for voice and uh, especially uh, text to speech and speech to text? Yes. So everything from the you know the, like the microphone that sits in your environment to everything else in the voice path is completely open source. Um, you know, one of the other sort of things as I, you know, I had some time over those years and whatever else, um, and, you know, Echo, Alexa, famously, I think, you know, starting last year, Amazon's financials, Echo's just been bleeding money. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's problematic. And one of the things I, you know, I sort of realized was, well, you're, you know, you're taking this device and you're putting it in your environment. It's like you're inviting someone into your house you need to be able to trust them or it. And, and so as long as there's no sort of trust with this device, that's, you know, potentially listening to your deepest, darkest secrets, then it's kind of a non-starter for, for a lot of people, especially those of us that are a little bit more involved in, in this kind of technology. We, we, we sort of understand some of the problems uh, associated with that lack of trust. And that's, that's a big part of why open source in general has been so successful. Um, so there's, you know, basically anything that has anything to do with your audio, your data, your environment is fully open source, self-hostable. You can audit the code, you can flash it um, on the on the inference server side, also open source. So, um, you know, you, you know, whether whether you want to just like download it and flash it and run it locally. And that's good enough for you. That's, that's, that's great. A lot of people do that, of course, uh, or you can go really hardcore and you can tear through the source and see that there is like nothing fishy, shady or sketchy going on with, uh, this, again, this device that's, uh, that's, you know, potentially listening to everything that you or your family says. Yeah, right. It's extremely important. It is. Uh, it's something that needs to be really made clear that it's uh, it's super important to be able to check the whole path the data takes. Like you really know where it's going and uh, what, what where it's coming back. And so, what can I do with Willow? What, what will it do for me? <laughs> so one of the one of the things that we emphasize, um, it, it, it's maybe you know maybe known to some but completely unknown to others. Um, so, uh, home assistant, I've been using home assistant for 10 years, um, it, you know, in, in my house and I've had, um, you know, a, a lot of fun playing with it and, and it's more open and locally hosted approach. Uh, and it's, it's also, it kind of runs my entire life. You know, I, I like, I haven't touched a light switch or carried keys to my house or my garage or anything for mm -hmm. the better part of a decade. Um, so the kind of first target for these home users was an integration to home assistant. And I'd like to, uh, especially in early stages, focus on like, well, what can we do and what can we do really well and where can we add value? So Willow as kind of cool as it is, and I certainly think it's cool, right? Um, but it, it's actually conceptually really simple. It's like, this is a dumb voice interface. It wakes up when you say the wake word, it streams your audio to this inference server, text comes out and we send that text to home assistant. Home assistant does whatever you have configured or defined with that text and that command. And it does that. And then a result comes back and we basically speak out the result. That's, that's it. It's, it's actually, it's really, it's really quite simple conceptually a lot harder in practice, mm -hmm. but, uh, at least in terms of where it fits in the picture, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I think that that's, you know, kind of another, another thing that, that, that comes up a bit. So home assistant, um, for those that don't follow it very closely, uh, has declared this, the year of voice voice interfaces has been something that historically in the 10 years of home assistant has has really been lacking so they've done a lot of their own work um, for you know kind of willow and willow type type things um, but they've also added a lot of the kind of supporting infrastructure and apis and such 
within Home Assistant. But we, we took the approach from the very beginning. Well, we don't want this tied to Home Assistant. We want, you know, whether you're using OpenHAB or some other platform, um, we, we want to be able to support other you know, other, other platforms that we can send these commands to and they can do something and then give us the results back. So there is an open source, sorry, I, I just, I don't happen to not know much about this word. So it's pretty, pretty interesting to me. Is there an open source protocol you can uh, leverage to control things like a smart blog or a, or a smart lights or whatever in a completely open source way? So um, one of the things that's best about Home Assistant is just, the sheer number of integrations. I, I mean, like it is, it is the like hub and, and in some cases spoke for like just about anything um, that, you know, you may have already purchased or, or whatever else. Unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of that's reverse engineering. It's during, it's dealing with, you know, commercial products that you have to do who knows what with. And um, some of the sort of, you know, the level of integration can vary. They do an excellent job across like thousands and thousands of devices and platforms. Um, but for the most part, the underlying protocols uh, are not open, but there's an emerging standard called Matter uh, that's increasingly being embraced by, you know, like kind of smart home device manufacturers. Uh, it's still new, it's still early and it's evolving. Um, but that's a kind of a, a, an open sort of standards compliant approach to the underlying sort of control of the, of the devices. Um, for voice in, in kind of the open source world, it's another one of these where it's, you know, it's very early. Um, you know, frankly, before Willow, uh, you know, the idea of like, again, a, a cheap, readily available device that does wake word, that can provide far field speech from 25 or 30 feet away, the kinds of things that you really need to make this actually practical and useful uh, didn't exist. So um, we're, you know, we're still sort of in the open source ecosystem working through how to, you know, how to do these kinds of things and, you know, with voice in a standards compliant way. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's you're right. So components are coming up. Uh, daily like there's even more stuff coming up every every day it's uh, it's clearly it's accelerating quite nicely i think it's just people decided they needed it honestly i didn't know about home assistant it sounds like it's a very very cool project and something that uh, well one question as a developer can i build something and deploy it to want to my willow box somehow is there any specific api will this just be something i do and run uh, how will they go and develop a custom module, for example? So the, you know, the good news is, you know, again, our focus is actually really quite narrow, right? So it's like, get the speech, transcribe it, send that somewhere. So today for kind of what I call command endpoints, uh, we have, uh, a, essentially a native integration, um, uh, to home assistant and open hab, but then we also have what we call generic rest. So you can define a, a REST endpoint that we send, we send JSON to, and it does, it, it could be whatever you want and take any actions of this kind of text output that we send. And then again, we'll, you know, if you provide a response, we'll, we'll play it at, we'll, you know, we'll do text to speech and, and play it out of the speakers. Uh, in terms of the Willow device itself, there's kind of good news and bad news here. Um, okay. The good news is, it's 50 you know 50 dollars espressive can crank these things out like hotcakes um you, you don't you don't see a lot of the you know supply supply chain constraints and and whatever else you might say you might see with something like a raspberry pi the bad news is it achieves that price point because at the end of the day it is a microcontroller and okay, it yeah. is a, an extremely challenge you know if you're like if you're coming from Oh, I, I take a Raspberry Pi and I flash something and I write a Python script. If you're coming from that world and you're getting into, uh, you know, the kinds of devices that Willow runs on, um, you're going to find that a, you know, a dual core 240 megahertz processor 
with tiny, tiny amounts of RAM. Doesn't do a lot. <laughs> it, 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 well, it it does it does quite a bit. It's it's pretty it's pretty remarkable. Um, you know, the problem is it's you know it's a real time operating system where you are manually controlling uh, you know threads and tasks and pinning things to core. Uh, excuse me, cores. Um, it's all C. So you are dealing with everything that comes along with that, in addition to the other challenges of kind of fundamentally being resource constrained in terms of the hardware, the real time operating system, and then your development on top of it. Well, then it's, uh, yeah, it is, uh, well, micro materials, I mean, but also what you're saying is that you could generally just interpret the speech somehow on your far end of the server. So there's not a lot you will need to deploy to the machine, really. It's uh, it is not so, for example, well, I do have a question too. Say, uh, so I'm already thinking about uh, making a video call over the signal wire network using WebRTC or using mm -hmm. something else. Uh, the device is probably capable of doing SIP, right? Yes. So would, uh, you, th in that case, you will need to write something that makes a SIP call using the camera and the microphone as input and using the screen as output and then go from there. But it's, well, it's my, I mean, it's C, right? It's C language in the end. Yes. Uh, and and we've, we've actually uh, unsurprisingly been asked about, about WebRTC and, uh, you know, as, as, as many of us know, and, you know, I go, I go way, way, way back with, with WebRTC from, from my other work here and actually, uh, you know, working with the free switch team on, on, um, early support for WebRTC and, and anybody that's done development with it um, knows that it can be pretty challenging. Um, the, you know, the standards that are involved with it um, are, are, you know, kind of pretty gnarly. Um, and yeah. as a, you know, kind of as part of that, um, you start getting into things like, oh, um, you know, the, there's like no mandated signaling protocol, but it does tend, you know, it does tend to run over an encrypted channel. And then you have to do ICE and DTLS and, you know, in many cases, port multiplexing and all these kinds of like fairly complicated things, um, which I, I don't know that I would go so far as to say that they're fundamentally impossible with the, you know, sort of the, the, the fundamentals of, of the hardware and the operating system. Uh, but it, it definitely to me doesn't make sense to implement it there. So, you know, this could be an opportunity for, you know, for something like, oh, yep, like it does a, a fairly, you know, a fairly lightweight, straightforward, you know, SIP audio and video call. And then it talks to FreeSwitch to, to handle the WebRTC bridging, for example. Yeah, that, that's my, that's why I was asking about SIP. I don't think it's, you're right. WebRTC requires a lot of local uh, transcoding and for starters, I mean, just Opus is heavy. Opus alone, the audio is heavy. Don't, don't even get started on the video, but actually the audio is heavier for uh, Opus is really super resource intensive. And then there's all the signaling, which is non-standard, uh, cryptography, et cetera. It might very well be that on a device like that, you just make a sub call to FreeSwitch or to SignalWire and bridge into the real, quote, video conference using dial plan functions for sure. Well, mm, you know, I've heard you'll be a speaker at KuCon, right? Of course. So I'll be there too. And maybe we can knock something out in the spare time. Why not? Yeah, I, I was going to say, as soon as you started talking about uh, your 5G device, I was like, oh, I sense a, uh, I sense a follow-up conversation here. <laughs> yeah, Definitely. so look forward to me and Christian banging away at something <laughs> <laughs> in the hall of ClickCon. So <laughs> if you see us, if you see something smoking on our table, just come ask. It means that the <laughs> device was just overloaded. Well, I, I managed to uh, heat up my 5G cell to the point it melted a piece of plastic. So we can definitely do that. It's, uh, <laughs> well, I was well, trying to. I, I don't, I don't know that we've, we've gotten to the place where we've tested the thermals on the device, but it sounds like we will. So we'll see. Yeah, what happens. absolutely. Well, anytime you have media going on, et cetera. In this case, too, the 5G cell was running an LLM locally. I was trying to run a, oh. run a Flan T5 on a 
because it is a dual core machine with 16 gigs of RAM. It's just that it's not built for the kind of load. So it melted a piece of plastic when sitting on it. So yeah, no, next time <laughs> I'll do it differently. But it's very interesting. And I think, I even think the local and home automation devices will start playing a role in the 5G networks too. Because it's, I mean, it's a, just a natural continuation. I'm moving some things from the cloud to the edge. I'm moving some things from the edge to local. So it's instantly available. It's really, it's really interesting. So let's do it. <laughs> Definitely. And, and, you know, um, what's really interesting about this, not to, not to, you know, go off on, on too many tangents, but Hey, that's what ClueCon weekly is all about. Right. Yep. <laughs> um, we've, you know, we've thought like, um, you know, people ask me like, well, well, you know, what's the monetization strategy here, whatever else. And in, you know, my position essentially is, oh, well, you know, I haven't forgotten about healthcare and they certainly haven't forgotten about me. So we're, we're already in, you know, early initial talks with, um, you know, some of our old friends in healthcare uh, to essentially make a, you know, kind of a commercial version of this, you know, of this device and just the overall platform. And one of the things that's actually come up is, can we send these home with patients? And one of the, you know, one of the key things there that we've already identified wow. is, well, we send these home with patients. It's like, what's their environment look like? How are we going to get this on their Wi-Fi, whatever else? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, we, we just won't deal with any of that. Uh, put a, you know, put a 5G radio in it and put it in a box. They take it home and they plug it in. That's it. And those are super cheap right now. Like the, well, and even getting cheaper. The client radios are super cheap and you can get traffic for normal prices. So yeah, that sounds like an interesting, well, <laughs> we're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah. We always, we always do, but it's, uh, it's, it's nice to, you know, to kind of have some sort of goal or something to work towards. Yeah. I think the whole IOT revolution, which is promised and device, smart devices, et cetera, is finally coming to fruition, but much like I, I, I feel on like an analogy here, I still think LLMs, GPT for people who don't know that GPT is a type of LLM, are not going to truly take over the market until you can run your own in the comfort of your private network. And smart devices and IoT is going to be very much more of the same. So Willow is a great building block. Yeah, and and so we um so the kind of uh, kind of accompanying piece to Willow is is what we call the Willow inference server. And uh, you know, so of course it does you know it does speech to text, it does text to speech. It also has the ability to to integrate with an LLM hosted within it. And you can chain these functions together, right? So it's like, I'm talking to a Willow device. I get the transcript that comes out of it. I hand it off to an LLM. I take the response from that. I do text to speech and then I play it out of the Willow device. And that's, that's already something that, you know, we're seeing a lot of people have interest in and it completely fits exactly, you know, what our sort of targets and goals are in, in what you're talking about of, oh, and by the way, you're not you're not even sending a transcript of this off to open AI or who knows who, right? Mm -hmm. Like it yeah. is, you, you could, you know, you could put this thing on a completely air gapped self-contained network and have all of the functionality that I'm talking about. Yep. That's uh that's the thing. I think, uh, there's various ways you're exposing your private data by simply using off the shelf devices. And any company based usage, I, I've said that I said that on open, on uh, Click on Weekly multiple times. We don't use Google, uh, not, it's not Google, it's not GitHub. We don't use GitHub Copilot internally because we don't know where it's sending the data, right? So it's okay to use some G, if you need a if you need to ask GPT a question, it's fine because it's isolated. Like you're looking for an algorithm or an example of the API, it's fine. But we we don't use Copilot because we don't know where the code is going. And a year from now, I don't want to find out someone else is using my code because it came out of GPT somehow. And the, uh, the same thing, I mean, you're perfectly right. Those microphones are listening to us all the time. So while for many people it might be okay, uh, most of us who work in technology should be aware of that because frankly, yeah, it's... Uh, Right, right. In the co-pilot, that, that, actually, I'm going to borrow that. That's um, that's a it, it's a 
a great sort of um, you know sort of analog and example. Um, the you know like to have a you know being involved in tech, right? It's if you you know you're working on something that could potentially be competing with Amazon, right? And you've got their device sitting there, <laughs> um, and they you know they've they've gotten you know they've gotten a lot of um, you know kind of like feedback, skepticism, whatever. And that yes, it is technically listening to you all the time, but theoretically, it's only actually streaming after the wake word is activated. But again, with a you know with a with a closed proprietary device, short of doing a bunch of network monitoring and other kinds of auditing things, is it really? You know, you, you don't yeah. you don't know that, right? And and when the stakes are really high, you need certainty on this. And, um, you know, like, again, this you know, co-pilot, great, 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 um, great, great comparison. Um, what I, you know, what I kind of like to say, and I'm still working on this is, you know, a, a great voice assistant is one that works. The best voice assistant is one that works and you can trust. And I, I think, you know, much like co-pilot, like, oh yeah, look it, you know, it wrote this code for me or whatever, but like, do you trust it? You know, do you like, do you trust the output? Do you trust wh whatever input that you gave it to get that output? And the answer is, how could you possibly fully trust it, right? Yeah. Um, you may trust the output because generally you're looking at the code. So sort of, I mean, you're sort of understanding what's going on, but it's not going to place a backdoor in your code. What I'm more worried about is that effectively your entire code base has been constantly sent back to whatever Azure service it is. Uh, and it's being incorporated in a, in a knowledge base somewhere. So if you're working on something that's remarkable, remarkably important, and some of us are, like there are there are some pieces of code that are worth million dollars by itself. Uh, you don't really want to know that a year from now, uh, GPT or Copilot casually starts spitting out your code to everybody. Yeah, and and you know especially for these you know these services that are offered on kind of a freemium model you know whatever else and you know who knows what kind of like you know who actually like reads an end user license agreement or any of these things um <laughs> you know who right i mean um so you know like they're generally speaking much much like you know echo devices um these large multi-billion dollar big tech companies are not offering these products and services for free because they're really nice guys, right? They're they're taking they're taking your interactions with it to to essentially like further what is a commercial product. So like whatever you're giving it, they are storing that, they are logging it, and they are using that to you know feed back into a model for training or who knows what. Um, so yeah, you just you, you there's really no way to know what the use of of any of that data looks like. I really like to frame it like this. Back in the day, there was a say, well, a few years ago, saying that used to say that if the product is free, it's because you are the product, and it's always been like that. So mm -hmm. uh, Amazon could probably give you the Echo devices for free. It doesn't. I mean, aside from the bigger, more expensive ones, the one with the larger screens, et cetera, those may be need to be sold, but they could give you the base docs for free. I think they almost put a price on it so that people don't request 20 of them just for, yeah. for reasons, but this, for, they will really, uh, it wouldn't really matter for them to give it away because that's not what the product is. Yeah. So. Um, you know, the, the, I think like, you know, more or less kind of the basic entry on a, on an echo is like, let's call it $50, which to me is really important because that makes Willow also price competitive with an echo, which is, which is again, kind of the first of its kind, um, th thanks to Espresso within sort of the, the open ecosystem. Uh, but then, yeah, you'll, you'll also see, you know, Amazon routinely discount them to $20 or something like, oh, we've got a fire sale on an echo. Um, and, and yeah, to your, to your point, it's, it's kind of, you know, the, the absolute bare minimum to discourage the kinds of, you know, sort of weird markets or secondary gray market, whatever kinds of 
you know, cottage industries or ecosystems that would develop if like anybody could show up and just, you know, with a bunch of fake accounts or something order, you know, 20 or a hundred of them for nothing. Yeah. Giving things away, general results and a lot of them going to waste at a minimum. So you just put a price on it. So people who want one, well, you're essentially paying for shipping or a bit more. It's, yeah. It's yeah. Really just that. It's, it's really just that. It still makes you aware that if you need one, you will pay for it. If you don't need one, you won't. But it's uh, it's really, really interesting. And uh, well, are those ESP boxes widely available in Europe and the US? Uh, I think so, right? You, Espressive has always been very good in uh, distributing stuff. Yeah, so this is this was actually a funny thing. Um, when I first uh, kind of announced, soft announced uh, Willow, it was essentially a, a, a show HN post on Hacker News. And, you know, we all really get excited about our pet projects, right? Just sort of like any parent, you know, we think our, mm -hmm. our children are just the greatest thing ever. Um, but you never, you know, you do this enough times, you realize you never really know if other people are going to share in the, you know, in the excitement that you do, and they're going to find it as interesting as you do. So uh, in, you know, complete honesty and setting expectations, I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to post this on HN and, you know, it'll mm. probably just like languish in obscurity somewhere and get, you know, five up votes in a comment or something. Um, I think it ended up at the top of the front page for like 36 hours or something like that. Um, and what that led to was all of the ESP boxes selling out worldwide um, it, over, over that, over that oh. time span. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, which is cool and might sound impressive, but one of the kind of interesting things about the ESP box and just it's kind of its capabilities. And again, the sort of challenge, you know, the challenges associated with doing voice with these things and just sort of the environment, um, they, you know, they've been around for about a year and my sense is Espressive never really sold any. Um, it, it was a, you know, really obscure device. And even people in tech circles were like, oh, this thing is great. How, how have I never, you know, heard of this? And I'm like, well, the software is, nobody's created software for it. The, the value, you know, it's a paperweight without software, right? So we were kind of the, you know, the first to come along and, and make software based off of this thing. And, and I was really happy to see Espressif certainly noticed this and their distributors noticed this of, hey, something happened. These things that have been sitting on the shelf for a year flew off the shelves and Espresso really stepped up and, and cranked up manufacturing capacity. And now you can you can buy as many as you want from whoever your local distributor is in your country. Well, I, I've had a similar problem with getting uh, software defined radios. There are a few open source SDRs you could theoretically buy if you could find one, <laughs> but they're, they used to originally retail at $300. Now you can find some on eBay for a thousand because they're just unfindable. So it is, it's a bottleneck, but expressive is big enough. There shouldn't be an issue. So that's, uh, that's yeah. And this is, um, you know, this is kind of, uh, I I've dabbled with, with SDRs before. So follow, you know, but I'm, I'm, certainly probably nowhere near where where you are um if i remember correctly there was the what was the you know the the device that was originally intended for like dvp dvb tv in europe or something it was like the rtl yep. something something yeah um with willow being based off of kind of the the esp that everybody all you know already knows and loves it's kind of the equivalent to that of like Oh, it was manufactured. It was manufactured in mass. Um, there's a little difference in that. Like it's kind of more of a developer platform than say the RTL was, but it, it was, you know, really going kind of all the way back to the 8266, starting this sort of like, oh, well, this is actually, you know, cheap, readily available hardware that makers and builders can do something with. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if the open source kind of voice user interface ecosystem matures to a place like where there's people like, you know, I think it is it at is Edis research still a big deal in SDRs. Yeah, they, they make the de facto 
uh, best portable stuff. So yeah, you still you still get them from them. But there are some open sources like the Hacker F or the mm -hmm. um, uh, Lime SDR. Yeah, I was gonna say Lime. Yeah, Lime. But they're all uh, impossible to find. Like literally, no way to get one. So your best bet is actually getting a Natos Research uh, entry level model. It's a couple grand. But of course, it's far more powerful than a Lime SDR. Still, no access to low and open source hardware. I feel like it's going to be a problem in many cases. Kind of like how it's completely different, but it's related. Running an LLM yourself right now, you still need a GPU. It needs to be a powerful one. So it's not just software you download. You need something for it to actually work. And that's going to be a bottleneck for a while. So there's, there's a lot going on there. Eventually, the supply chain will figure itself out always happens so looking forward to that <laughs> yeah and it well and it's interesting you mentioned gpus because um we you know we've kind of taken a somewhat controversial stance in that like you know basically to you know to me at least personally what it boils down to is you can run a lot of this stuff on a cp on a cpu of whatever platform right and there's you know, there's all kinds of efforts for, you know, Llama and Falcon and, you know, essentially you name it in the LLM yeah. space to run on CPU. And that's great to kind of improve the, you know, improve the access and, and not have to deal with CUDA and NVIDIA binary drivers and all of that. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to make something that's like actually usable or reasonably competes with kind of anything that you'd see in the commercial space, uh, you, you know, you still, at least for today in the foreseeable future, again, it's sort of my, I don't have a crystal ball or anything, but mm -hmm. my personal take is, look, a, you know, an RTX 3090 has 19,000 CUDA cores and mm -hmm. like al almost, um, you know, I think it's like 996 gigabytes a second of, of, uh, of memory bandwidth, like the, you know, a six year old nvidia tesla p4 or gtx 1070 or something like that that you can buy for a hundred dollars will run circles around the most capable cpu you can buy on the market yeah. because they're just so fundamentally physically and architecturally different and they're the right tool for for these kinds of tasks it might very well be that we're looking at uh you know laptops haven't had integrated gpus for a while might very well be that we're looking to the return of an integrated GPU chipset or even hybrid chips. I have read somewhere that someone was trying, looking at the idea of having a core that's a CPU plus a GPU in the same place. It's it's funny because we're going back to the, you know, it's the, the coprocessor of the 486 architecture age. It's weird. Like technology just goes back to the same place every time. It's yeah, like, right. It's it's like the same movie over and over again. And yeah, I you know I I'm I'm just old enough to remember exactly what you're talking about. Of like, oh, this CPU has an FPU. Wow. <laughs> I'm looking forward to get to buying a DX processor again. Like right, exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, like, it's, whatever it's like, DX. I, yeah, I had the SX, and now I have the DX. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. It, it can it, do it math. <laughs> I think we just, uh, I'll tell you, I think we just both sort of gave away our ages. So, well, I mean, it's, uh, it is, uh, it's been a fun ride. So we, we did live in the best age of developing technology, in my opinion, because we got to put our hands on it. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, like what Apple is doing with Apple Neural is, is super interesting when you, when you look at, I mean, even you know, the, the kind of the, the quantum leap of sorts that was, you know, the M1, let's say, and now they've really kind of cranked it up several notches in short order with the M2. And you start to see increasingly competitive. Some people will say like, oh, you know, an M2 Ultra has the performance of a RTX 3090. It's like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> But but that doesn't mean that it's not getting there. And, you know, of course, with like with the resources that, you know, the resources and the tremendous talent that Apple has available, um, I think we'll, you know, we'll start to see, um, at least within the Apple ecosystem, um, you, you know, like being competitive with with discrete GPUs. And, you know, Intel's doing some some interesting things with their new discrete GPUs with the Arc platform. Oh, yeah. 
Um, obviously, their dominance, uh, you know, less so these days as AMD has been doing really well, too. Um, but I, I think there's kind of a, you know, an interesting future where you, you know, start to see, um, you know, like, <clears throat> excuse me, integrated platforms that have, uh, you know, kind of. It almost has to happen because there is this stuff that needs to be run on GPUs and people just want that. So if people want that. So it's going to happen. That's usually how it is. Yeah, it'll well, it'll it'll get sorted eventually. Just, you know, just, every, just like every that's, time that's, in the market has wanted something, it has happened. So I'm just looking forward to see what cool stuff comes out. Well, well, Christian, thank you so much for joining us today. I mean, it was uh, we we had a very interesting chat about. Well, first of all, Willow, which I'm actually gonna order an ESP box right after the call and <laughs> get started on playing with it, uh, so I can have something fun to play with at uh, GlueCon. Glucon, by the way, is going to be in August from the 14th to the 16th in uh, Chicago at the Drake Hotel. The website is glucon.com. Go sign up. Come meet me. Come hear Kristen speak. Come look at us uh, trying to set something on fire by doing something <laughs> not supposed to be done. And come look at us doing a dangerous demo about it sometime uh, during the week. So it's, uh, it's always a fun conference. I'm looking forward to it. And again, Christian, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. Great to be back. Christian Kilofner from Tavera, from the Willow Project, joined us today. We talked about the fantastic Willow Project, which is a home automation, open source home automation assistant based on ESP platform. Links in the, will be in the description for the GitHub and getting the hardware and a couple other information points. And well, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. And for the rest of the people, I see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>